Well, hello and welcome back to the All Saints podcast. I'm here with a very special guest today. It is Pastor Randy Booth of Grace Covenant Church in Nacogdoches. Pastor Booth, thank you for joining us. Glad to be here. Uh, Pastor Booth is visiting us this weekend. We're recording this on uh, Friday afternoon. Pastor Booth is uh, leading a men's discipleship breakfast on the subject of masculinity, particularly directed at fathers. And then on Sunday, he's preaching from Malachi chapter 4, which raised an eyebrow or two in my mind as I was looking at it. That's <laughs> going to be exciting. Looking forward to that. And, and actually, what we're wanting to do here at All Saints is to take this opportunity of Pastor Booth's visit to kick off a series of midweek Bible studies, which will be beginning uh, on Wednesday next week, as I'm, we're recording this now, uh, on the subject of raising faithful children. So really what we're doing, we've got six weeks kicked off by Pastor Booth, uh, thinking about being fathers, being fathers and mothers, and engaging particularly in the task of raising godly kids. And I thought I would just grab you in between you arriving in a bit of a yep. whirl from Nacogdoches and before you and Marinelle have even had a chance to go to your hotel, probably. Um, and um, just to thank you for joining us. And I wanted to uh, get some thoughts from you just to lay the table for us. Before we jump in, um, I, w- I want to give people a chance to get to know you. Okay. So give us the two to three minute version of yourself, your family, right. your wife, Marinelle, your church and so on. Great. I grew up in Shreveport, Louisiana, uh, faithful parents. My father just turned 92. My mom passed away last December at age 90. Uh, Faithful Christians who raised us in the church, and I'm very grateful for that, and so have a great heritage behind me. My wife and I were born in the same hospital two months apart in Shreveport, met in high school, uh, began to see one another, married after our first year of college. We were 19 years old. And we celebrate our 50th wedding anniversary this August the 9th. Mm. So just in a few weeks. 50th. 50th wedding anniversary. We have three grown children, married, 18 grandchildren. I had the privilege of marrying my oldest granddaughter last July. Mm -hmm. And two weeks before that, my newest granddaughter was born (laughs) on my birthday. So we've had had a lot of exciting things going on in terms of our our family and... uh, I've been pastoring. Uh, March was my 40th anniversary as a pastor. I've been in Nacogdoches for 24 years Mm -hmm. as of the end of this month. And so I have a lot of anniversaries going on. And um, so been exciting to see. And I'm grateful to have all my children walking with the Lord and seeing them raise my grandchildren in the faith, and that's exciting to see as well. That's great, that's great. And um, uh, your wife, uh, Marinelle, uh, married 50 years. Yes. Uh, did you do anything special to celebrate your anniversary? We Are you did. Doing anything special? We did. You know about this. We, <laughs> went, to, we went to Europe. We went to uh, London, Paris, uh, Glasgow, Edinburgh, Oban, Scotland, spent two weeks, walked 82 miles. I didn't know I could do that, but I had my <laughs> Fitbit on, and we climbed a lot of hills and saw a lot of scenery, went with some good friends, David and Nicole Alders. Great, great. And uh, ate at some great restaurants, Excellent. and uh, it was outstanding. Well, the reason I wanted to ask you that was really just to hear you say Edinburgh. Okay. <laughs> Did you say Edinburgh? I think I said that. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, had well, th- I haven't thought about how I say it. Yeah, I'm so. pretty sure that neither of us will be understood by most Scotsmen. So I, don't think I didn't understand. Of all the places we were in, Scott, the Scott. Yeah. The accent was the hardest to understand. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I needed a translator. Yeah, Scotsmen and women who moved to somewhere like rural Mississippi would have quite a task on their hands. Yes, they would. <laughs> um, so uh, discipline. One of the things that is always in my mind when I think about this is that uh, discipline of children ought to be understood as, in the broadest sense, as cognate with discipleship. Yes. Um, perhaps it's right to uh, emphasize there is a, a, a negative aspect to it in the sense of correcting kids when they stray off the path. But really what we're thinking about in the, in the broadest sense when we talk about raising faithful children and therefore disciplining children is discipling them. We want our yes. kids to be disciples of Jesus. We want them to follow along the way. And uh, obviously there's a great deal of uh, reflection in Christian literature and Christian wisdom on how to do that, how to correct them when they step off the path, how to encourage them along it, and so on. And maybe if we start off like this, you've got three kids, faithful, walking with the Lord. Um, what, what are the, are there any big lessons that stand out to you that you've learned as a father 
that you've had to pass on as a pastor that relate to this whole area of discipling and disciplining and raising faithful kids? I think one of the things I would point out is that this is an ever-changing situation for parents. So you're obviously, if it's your first child and you're young, you're you're at one level. So God is also training you and disciplining, discipling you in this process. So every time you're teaching your children something, God's also teaching you. You're still his child. Then you get a second child, a third child. Their personalities are different and circumstances are different in your family. Uh, so, and then as, as each of your children go through different phases, I remember my father telling me, uh, you're, you've never been 14 and I've never been the father of a 14 year old. Hmm. Well, the, the next 14 year old comes along and he says, and I've never been the father of this 14 year old. Yeah. So, so there's cultural circumstances that are changing, different temptations. I think there's a temptation to grow lax, perhaps uh, grow weary and well-doing if you've got a number of children. Hmm. And so it, recognizing that it's dynamic, it's always changing, and, and that's why it takes wisdom, and that's why it takes constant awareness. It's not like you can get a system in place, uh, a series of checkboxes that you can go through mm. and do this well. Right, right. Cultural changes then. Let's focus in on that. Um, you must have seen some things in... How many decades? I'm so old. I'm, I'm so old. We had eight-track tapes when I started, and we went to cassettes and CDs, and yeah. now, now yeah. here we are at the internet and all kinds of things. That uh, yeah, well, I, I'm not that old, but I can still remember when um, uh, the uh, the pastor at the church that I was interning at in 2001 said, "I think what we should do with our sermons is put them on on the internet." Yes. And I thought that was a complete waste of time, <laughs> right? Because I thought, well, I've got the tapes. I listen to them in the in the car. That's right. right. Want... Anyway, um, we, we digress. So. So cultural changes then? Well, here's, I think one thing that's important to remember, we, we talk a lot about cultural changes and we should. I think, let's take the internet as an example or technology. These are megaphones. They magnify what has always been the case. Fundamentally, I'm not sure there's anything new. The, the temptations are the same. There may be more of them. It may be louder. Uh, so I'm not saying there are no differences, but fundamentally the issues are always the same. Human nature is the same. Right. Temptation to s various kinds of sins, whether it's entertainment or sexual things or, uh, you know, th that range of temptation. We go to Genesis uh, and we say, you know, the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. Hmm. So that was true then and it's true now. And these are the technology, just like the technology enables us to do what we're doing now with this podcast, it can also enable sinful things to be done bigger, right, faster, right. and so forth. So we certainly have to be aware of those additional uh, factors that make this bigger and, and more, um, more seductive, perhaps. But the problem of raising children hasn't really changed right, and is not right. going to change because we're really fundamentally dealing with hearts and right, minds. Right. And um, So that's interesting because especially when you start to think about the impact of uh, modern social movements that have the effect sometimes of alienating parents from their children and making attempts by the parents to reestablish contact seem like part of the problem. This is something that arises in critical social justice ideology. Yes. When parents, well, if, if children feel uh, alienated for whatever reasons, good or bad, or justified or unjustified from their parents, the, the parents' attempts to say, listen, let's just sit down and talk about it, that is within a, kind, within a Foucauldian paradigm of there's no truth, there's only power. That's an attempt at manipulation. Right. So in a sense, that's new. But what you're saying is, yeah, but the sinful tendencies that drive the the things that break relationship in the first place are the same things. Yes. We're dealing with the same kinds of, right. So how would you flesh out those abiding issues then? If you say, okay, through all this swirling chaos of the modern world where the same temptations take different forms the same sins manifest themselves in different ways how would you identify some of those abiding sins the the big the big ones to look out for the big dangers you think 
Well, I like, in approaching this subject of child discipline, I like to boil it down to what I'd say are the most fundamental uh, issues to keep it simple for the for me uh, to know, all right, what is it I'm trying to do to remember that? So, for example, in sc Scripture, there's really only one command given to children with two parts, honor and obey your parents. Hmm. So respect. So if I, if I remember that the fundamental thing that I want to teach my children in every situation is to respect God, to respect me, as a parent mm -hmm. and others, your siblings or whoever it is, that's your, that's your one job as a child <laughs> is to show respect. Mm -hmm. And for me to teach you to do that, as I always say, my goal is for you to be self-governed under God. Right. And, and if you won't govern yourself, I will. <laughs> that's my job. And I want to, I want to work myself out of a job. Right. And that, that speaks to the issue of stepping back when your kids grow up, isn't it? So the sooner, the sooner you can govern yourself, the less you'll have me telling you what to do. Hmm. So that means I have to inculcate in their hearts and minds the things that I love and desire. Mm -hmm. So another issue, and I'm kind of moving in a little different direction, but I think about church discipline the same way. But if we go to uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scriptures given by inspiration of God and is profitable for four things— Doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. So doctrine is, again, back to child discipline. Most of what I do in discipline is teaching. Te verbally, uh, training, demonstrating, showing what to do, what's expected, um, and doing that in a gracious way, in a, in a joyful way that makes it attractive and not harsh. Uh, so it's always bathed in grace, but it also has to be insistent and firm. But most of it is positive instruction. Uh, a, 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 a doctrine reproof is when they don't do it, and now I have to correct you. And I want to use the least amount of correction that's necessary. Sometimes it's a look. Sometimes it's a single word, stop. Sometimes it's more than that. So I like to think of discipline uh, in the sense of uh, uh, correction and re uh, reproof and correction is something like a rheostat or a dimmer switch. I don't want to start with the harshest thing, I'm going to spank you or whatever. There, there's a place for that, but we don't begin with that. What's the least amount that will bring about the desired behavior and attitude? Mm -hmm. And then correction uh, is going to involve not just stop or you're wrong, but now I'm going to tell you what you did wrong. And as they get older, I think you want to solicit that from them. What did you do wrong? Because most of the time they know. And me just mm -hmm. wagging my finger at them and telling them for the 50th time is not going to do it because they, now they just are looking aside and, you know, here we go again. But if I ask them, what did you do wrong? Interesting. Yeah. They can usually tell me. Right. And then I say, what, what should you have done? Mm -hmm. And uh, what are you going to do next time you're in this situation? So you're, you're helping train them to think through right. their behavior. They're learning to articulate yes. righteousness. And then instruction in righteousness is just the ongoing work. I, I saw it described once as doctrine tells us what road to walk on. Correction tells us where we got off. Reproof tells us how to get back on. And instruction tells us how to stay on the road. Mm -hmm. like so that model for me is is understanding what it is I'm trying to do because the goal, again, is I'm raising not children but adults. Right. Now, I really like that thought about that you just finished with there as well as the, the overall picture makes such a lot of sense because in, in practical terms, Scripture does not speak about any of the social and ideological changes that we have seen in the last 2,000 years right. in explicit terms. It, but it gives you this framework. Yes. So it must be the case that it's possible to navigate that um, with wisdom using those scriptural tools. Uh, but it, it, does, it, it strikes me that um, the, the attentiveness to how those uh, particular needs are reflected in this particular situation is what's required of, of great parents. Right. Right. Well, I think another key thing, if, if the goal, if the primary goal is to teach my children about respect for authority, respect for God, honor your father and your mother, uh, so from the child's perspective, father and mother are the same, same entity. One, we're one flesh as husband and wife, 
and we are one entity for children. And then from there, the implications are everybody else in your life. Uh, for, for children, most of them are inferiors to everybody. Uh, and they have siblings, so they may have equals. But essentially, they still have an obligation to love their neighbor. Love God and love your neighbor. But if, if I'm going to teach my child to, to show respect, that means I have to know how to show respect to my children regardless of their age. Now, how I show that to a two-year-old is different than how I might show it to a 15-year-old. I'm not their buddy. I'm not, I'm not their equal. I'm still always their superior, but I, a superior still must show respect for those who are under their care. And by modeling that respect, not only in terms of my direct relationship with this child, but toward my wife, toward other relationships that they see me in as a father, is critical for them to know what that looks like. Right, I'm not right. just telling them what to do. I'm showing them what that looks like, even when I'm correcting them for not being respectful. Right. And that con connects with what you're saying about raising adults, not raising children. Yes. Uh, I wanted to probe that a little bit more because uh, one of the things I'm looking forward to developing in Wednesday Night Bible Studies in a couple of weeks' time is th the insight that you get by by imagining yourself two or three or four steps down the road and and then looking back at the stage you're at now and letting those later stages or where you want to be in those later stages inform what you do now so how should you deal with this two-year-old okay. well think of the 15 year old you want her to grow into yes. and work backwards so i'd love to get your take on that okay. to, to to what extent is that helpful, and, and what sort of insights would you glean from yes, that? Yes, I, I, I think that's very helpful. In fact, all, all human beings have strengths and weaknesses, and you see certain traits. We had a, a family over last night for the first time, and they had a, a three-year-old and a, a less than one year, a little over one-year-old, and you could already see certain traits in them. Uh, they were cute children and playful, but you could see one was much more active than the other and that kind of thing. So those traits, your strength is often your weakness. And so as you notice that, first of all, it's always going to be easier for you to, to manage and um, mold and shape the character of a two-year-old or three-year-old or four-year-old. And if you don't, if you don't help manage that, uh, that trait's still going to be there when they're 15. It's just going to be a lot more difficult to deal with. So you I always say, as parents, I, I need to win the war. I always need to win. Right. Uh, I like to tell this story about my three-year-old, my youngest daughter. One day I was home at lunch, and I'd ask her to, I told her to pick up her toys, and she just stood there and looked at me, and uh, she was obstinate. She right. knew how to right. pick up toys. She'd done it many times. <laughs> this is not difficult. We were homeschooling, so I, her older brother and sister were in the other room, and this went on for about 10 minutes, and I was down on my knees, and I'd gotten my wooden spoon, was our weapon of choice. And I Not was, down on your knees pleading, I take it, down no, on your knees. I was down on my knees, face, just looking at her, and yeah, I said, you know, pick it up, and she's just looking at me. Mm -hmm. And I'd swat her, and she'd cry, and I'd say, all right, pick it up. We're not leaving. Daddy, you know, says to pick it up. Mm -hmm. You need to pick it up. So... Her older sister walked by very quickly to get something out of the bedroom, and on the way back, uh, my older, her older sister, who was just two years older, stopped and looked at her and said, Rachel, Daddy always wins. <laughs> and she, Rachel reached down and picked it up and put it in the basket. It was over. Right, right. It right. was like, oh, okay, yeah. I need somebody to remind me of that. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. think the other, the other thing is, uh, so I think it's good to think, who do I want this person to be, and how am I going to help shape them that way? Mm. And then also noticing those traits that you say, we need, to, we need more of this and less of that. And I think that uh, another thing that I think is helpful, and it fits in with this age bracket, a lot of people who may be listening to this might be familiar with classical Christian education. And I wrote an article a few years ago called The Trivium in Biblical Perspective. So mm -hmm. you take the uh, grammar, logic, and rhetoric phases. I think those match up very nicely with uh, knowledge, understanding, and wisdom yeah, in the right. Bible. Yeah. So in the early years, it's a lot about knowledge. They're learning to talk. They're learning, don't touch this, do that, don't do this. And there's a lot more of, I told, uh, because daddy said to. Why? Mm -hmm. Because I told you to. That's all you really need to do. Your, your one job is to obey me. 
as they get older into that middle phase understanding, they're supposed to be asking why. But you teach them how to ask why, and you explain it, and then sometimes they still don't understand it, and then you still say, because I said so. That's always fundamentally the same way God does with us. Right. You, you, I want you to understand it, but you don't wait to understand it to do it. And then, but the ultimate goal is that wisdom phase. You're out, you're 17 and you're on your own somewhere and you're trying to decide, should I do this or not do this? Now all that you've learned and knowledge and understanding gets applied to a new situation and that's where self-government comes in, where right. wisdom is yeah, the, like the, the goal. Yeah, your story reminds me of um, uh, something I witnessed. And this is always encouraging when you see this with a family at church and um, Nicole and I went around for dinner with a, a, a young a, a young couple who's got got a child, and we were sitting at the table, and the the child was at the end of the table in her special little chair, and she had her food in front of her. She's quite a young child, like a couple of years old, and the food was basically the same as what the adults were eating, and she was sitting there waiting for her mother to tell her that she could eat it, and I just thought that. That picture spoke a thousand words to me. I, I was so encouraged because I and I wanted to encourage the mum and dad. And I did. I, I said a couple of things to dad at church the next day and said, "Look, you, what you're doing is great because you're let's put, it, put it differently now. But you, really, what you're doing is you're placing before your child uh, a manifestation of the future that you want them to grow into. But it's embedded in present possibility. So." they can learn to relate cheerfully and joyfully to other adults around a table. And the way they'll do it at the age of 19 months or whatever yes. is by sitting and waiting. Right. Not by having special allowances made for them because they're little. And often I think we underestimate yes. what kids are capable of. And you find that eventually you've got the four-year-old who won't go to sleep unless mum's lying in the bed with him. And you right. just think, Jesus, well, you've, you, you're... you're actually going backwards you're creating problems. you get more of what you pay for yeah yeah you, you, you're you're subsidizing <laughs> that's right the 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 problems that really you should be trying to grow out of and your kid is capable of growing out of those if you'll just show them the way well understand the fundamental problem with all of us is we're selfish two two-year-olds in a room with one toy is my definition of immaturity christ of course is our definition of maturity he laid down his life for his friends so self-sacrifice for others so yes, child, you're important mm -hmm. in this family, but you are not all important. Right. And a large part of what we're training in our children is the world does not revolve around you. Mm -hmm. Now, you get many things you want and desire, and you're part of this. You get the blessings, but you only get the blessings when you also make the loving sacrifices. And so we're building in our homes a communion of, of love. And everything we do should be contributing to that. And so when anybody, the two-year-old or the dad, acts selfish, it tears the whole system apart. Right, right. There's two other areas I would really want to emphasize and mention, and, uh, and they're kind of opposites. So let me start. I want to get to indulgence of children in a minute, but holy insistence is a term that I've kind of coined so I see soft parenting sometimes. Um, I'm going to be speaking to fathers this weekend, so I'll emphasize that. It can be with fathers or mothers that that very, we want to be their buddies, and we're kind of, oh, come on, honey, sweetie, let's please do this. And we're kind of begging our children to be obedient and, and soft. And when they're not obedient, then we get up and do it for them uh, or uh, that kind of thing where we really don't, we, we want to make sure they don't get in any kind of... Yeah. Come uh, along, sweet little one. Yes. Yeah. And so holy, in the, but, but also their parents on the other side are too harsh. They're mm -hmm. angry. This is irritating them. You're, you're making my life hard, and I'm angry and, and ticked off, and I'm going to now pour that out on you. And, and so holy insistence is the, the sweet spot, where it's, mm -hmm. it's holy because it's sanctified, it's godly, it keeps in mind that I'm here to love this child and bring them into conformity to, to the Lord. And I want to do that in, in a way that is insistent. That is, I'm not looking the other way. I'm not making excuses for their bad behavior. Yeah. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Right. And I love my child, and I will chasten my child when they need that. And I'll do it firmly. I said stop, and I mean stop right now. Do you understand me? That's holy insistence. I'm not yelling. I'm not 
losing my temper. I'm not being disrespectful, but I am being insistent. And I'm insistent in the moment, not after the 10th time. Hmm. If I told you to stop, I mean for you to stop okay. now. They're counting to three in Walmart. Right. right. So there's that. The, the opposite of this is the indulgent parent. I, I saw uh, this one stuck in my mind for years. We were had some a, co- a couple old, o- over. They have three kids. Two of them were teenage boys. They were playing basketball. They had a 12-year-old daughter, and we were going to be driving about five miles away and coming back. And suddenly the mom decides that she wants the daughter to come uh, with us because she didn't think the older brothers would watch her and she was afraid she might go out in the street. This is a 12-year-old girl. Right. So they open the van door and they say, oh, come on, come with us. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. And the mom literally gets out and has her by the lapels, pulling her into the van. And the father's in the driver's seat. I'm in the passenger seat on the front. And, he, and she's screaming, has all fours out, trying to keep from getting in the, in the car, in the van. And the father says, uh, Princess, if you'll get in, I'll buy you some ice cream. Oh, my word. <laughs> well, I, yeah. I almost screamed in my seat. I didn't. I held my tongue. But, uh, oh. Ouch. Yeah. Yeah, that's, a, that's one 18-year-old coming down the pike right there. Yes. Yeah. So. That's a tragedy. So indulgence. God indulges us. He gives us all kinds of things we don't deserve because he loves us and he mm-hmm. tells us to go feast. And, but he doesn't tell us to go feast all the time. He, and he doesn't, doesn't tell us that um, the sin that you're doing doesn't need to be repented of and doesn't matter. That, that's right. right. So you don't get to sin in this, in this yeah. thing. But, in, but overindulgence is, is really what I'm, It's not that you never give your kid ice cream. Uh, it's that you don't do it. You certainly don't do it to reward misbehavior or to try to get compliance to obedience. Right, right. The other issue, one other issue I would just mention is the need for a lot of joy in your household. Joy and grace. Uh, those are, you know, we could probably add other words to that. At the end of every week, you're going to have some tears in your family or else you're not doing it right. You better have had a lot of joy to go with that. If you look back in the rearview mirror and there wasn't a lot of joy along with the tears, you're doing something wrong. Right, right. Your table ought to be a happy place. There ought to be some joking around, some laughter, some fun. Mm. And then there's a time to set that aside. It's time to work. And we're going to enjoy the work. Mm. We're going to find pleasure in hard things. And again, they need to see that in you. I hate to see a father who's always saying, go do the dishes. And they've never seen dad do the dishes. Right. I had a boss one time said, never, I said, I gave the old cliche, never ask anyone to do something you're not willing to do. He said, no, never ask anyone to do something they haven't seen you do. Hmm. And I think that's a much better uh, yeah, that's good. That's good. statement. So, um, Something you mentioned in passing, harshness. I wonder if there's a danger in our circles um, where w- what we're self-conscious of wanting to be becomes exaggerated and caricatured to the point of sinfulness. Yes. So, look, we're, we're the conservative, reformed Christians who want to take seriously the covenant promises of God, who know that the Lord disciplines those he loves, who know that <coughs> no discipline seems pleasant at the time but painful, and therefore, boy, are we committed to making our kids' lives painful. Right. And we can do that. We can ramp up the harshness. And I wonder if you perceive that as a danger... Um, maybe particularly for dads, I don't know, who that w- it's as though they're looking for a way of expressing in their parenting what they think they ought to be growing into as mature Christian men, and what they end up expressing is a caricature of it, which torments right. the kids. Yeah, I, I, look, there are ditches on both sides here. Mm-hmm. And part of anything that we're trying, remember, we're growing. God's training us and teaching us. And so, uh, we need to be. We need to know where those ditches are on either side. Obviously, indulgence or being too soft is the ditch on one side, but harshness, uh, legalism, um, uh, that kind of demanding thing that is not filled with grace and joy. And so, we, we need to. Know, wisdom is knowing the difference between those things, between right. being indulgent and being full of grace. Yeah, yeah. There's a difference, and there's a difference between being insistent and being harsh. Harsh has an anger to it, a, a vengeance to it, a, um, um, 
a resentfulness to it and a bitterness. It has an emotional yeah. overlay, and, doesn't it? And we're, we are not trying to simply raise well-behaved kids. Right. We want the hearts of our children. And I'm going to be talking about that on Sunday in the Malachi passage that at the, at the very heart of the gospel, we're told, Christ was coming and the first thing he was going to do was return the hearts of the fathers to the children. Right, right. And the children's hearts to, to the, the fathers. fathers. <laughs> yes. That was the central thing the coming of Christ was going yeah, to do yeah. because many together. in the covenant had forgotten that. Wow, well, yeah. And had become unfaithful in that, either by neglecting their children or overly. Mm. And how many families, you and I have seen this in both directions, the, the, the families who don't do anything and the kids are like, you know, uh, uh, feral cats. Or you've got the overly harsh, strict um, family, maybe with good intentions. Right, yeah. Always but then, intentions. But then resentment. Yeah. And yeah. Um, uh, so people become estranged. As soon as I can get out of here, I'm out of here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so that's... Interesting. The... Um, it keys into another question I was going to ask you about the idea of turning the hearts of fathers to the children uh, calls to mind the observation that we've got many uh, men in the congregation here who uh, they love their own fathers, uh, but maybe the relationship with their own fathers wasn't great. Uh, their own fathers may have been uh, not Christians or very immature Christians or uh, may have left their families at an early stage and so on. So a lot of guys are coming from a place where they haven't had great role models. And there are some obvious problems with that. The, the less obvious problem that I've started to wonder about is men who don't realize just how much time it takes to parent well. Like you, you can't do this with just a couple of minutes of brief exchanges of how's, how's your day to your wife at yes. the end of the day. There is a huge investment of time in training your child like if you're if your kid who's two won't sit still in worship what that means is you have 10 or 20 hours of work to do over probably four to six weeks of sitting down with them and joyfully when they're in a not tired and in a a good place to train them to learn to stand sit kneel and you extend the time gradually and you you but you can't do it kind of in and among all the other That's right. things you do. It has to be intentional. Right. You have to have a plan. You have to be a, part of what you're doing as a father, as, as a husband of the vineyard, uh, is you're looking to see where there's cracks in the wall and weeds in the garden and all those things that you're attending to. Mm. Because if you neglect that, those, those grow into much bigger problems. Tomorrow morning in our session with fathers, I'm going to be focusing on Deuteronomy 6. But so, for example, sometimes people think, well, we do, let's say we do family devotions every morning at breakfast for five, ten minutes or whatever length of time. That's good. I'm all for that. But that's not what Deuteronomy 6 is talking right, about. Right. It's when you're um, walking along the way. It is everywhere. Yeah. It is. It permeates your conversation. And, again, it's not that you're always quoting a Bible verse, mm. but you are, are always thinking biblically. You're always thinking in the context of how our family is a reflection of, of the communion of God, the community of God. So we do that at church, which is a reflection of the Trinity. Uh, and so our church is an outpost of, of the Trinitarian communion. And then we go to our houses and we do it. We're the outpost of the church at our house. And we do it at our tables. We do it in the living room. We do it on walks. We do it in the car. Right. It just, it, it, it's the air we breathe. And yeah. that is more important, I think, than... Taking just take let's say you just take somebody to church and you have a time when you teach the Bible and maybe you pray with them before they go to sleep and so there's these moments as opposed to this sense of uh, permeating the whole culture of your family so that they see you you're you're having some kind of an issue let's say you and your wife and what amazing thing if your children just saw mom and dad say well why don't we step in here and pray about this first before we finish talking right right. That yeah. that's the kind of though they see you ask for forgiveness for thing. each other. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, at the risk of opening another massive can of worms, let me <laughs> throw another um, a wrench in the machine. Uh, boys and girls ain't the same, and um, and not all boys are the same, and not right, all girls are right. the same. So we've got we've got um, obviously uh, uh, ov- overlaid on the personal differences between individual people. You have broader 
creational differences between boys and girls and between mum and dad. And so you've got you know, four sets of relationships there. Do you have any <laughs> thoughts, a brief, oh, nice brief condensed <laughs> thoughts about, about how the dynamic of those differences uh, impacts parenting when parenting is going well or when parenting is going badly? I, um, I have to think a bit about how to narrow that down. I'd say, first of all, I, I, I want to resist anything that is artificial in terms of, okay, this is men's work and this is women's work. I think there are divisions, certainly different differences in masculinity and femininity, both in terms of how we dress, how we comport ourselves, how we interact with people. And then obviously there are different temperaments and personalities, outgoing and quiet and all those things that are, all those are factors in us knowing how to shepherd, and that is the work of a father, shepherding his children uh, and caring for them and meeting individual needs uh, accordingly. But then recognizing that the differences between boys and girls, men and women, is not just the obvious uh, uh, physiological differences in them, but everything in a woman is female and everything in a man is male down to our DNA. And so uh, we're preparing them for different kinds of labor and work, again, full of joy, full of purpose. Uh, I want to raise women, uh, raise girls that become women who men respect. Hmm. And that means they have to know how to respect themselves, how to respect their parents, and how to be intelligent. I say all the great men I know look up to their wives. Yeah. Okay, I look up to mine. And, it, and, and yet my wife also knows and we know what our biblical callings are in our positions as mm-hmm. husbands, wives, fathers, and mothers. But that's not as persons. My wife is smarter than me, more talented than me in all kinds of things. And I'm thankful for that. God knew I needed that. That's, it's a gift to me. And hopefully, likewise, I'm a gift to her. And together we're stronger mm-hmm. as one working together. And again, from the children's perspective, mom and dad are one. Well, I want to raise daughters in light of that. I want them to, I, I want them to marry someone that they respect as much as they respect me. Right. That's interesting. And yeah. so teaching... Which means you need to be worthy of respect. I, that's right. right. And yeah. so girls who don't respect their fathers are boy crazy. Right. They... So they need man they, They're looking... They're, they have father hunger. They're looking right. for... And the problem is teenage boys only know how to give one kind of affection, and it's not father affection, Mm -hmm. even the best of boys. And I want to raise men who respect women. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we've got a world full of young adults, who, who, women who don't respect men, and again, a lot of times because of poor fathering, and a lot of young men who don't respect women for similar reasons. Women are objects. Women are things to, to do things for them as opposed to laying their lives down for them. Mm-hmm. Interesting. And so I think you start, if you have brothers and sisters, that's a great place to start. You don't talk to your sister that way. You don't treat her. To, you, know, you and your brother can lay on the floor and wrestle, but you can't, you can't do your sister that way. So there, every family is going to be a little different too. I don't, I'm not for cookie cutter. The basic biblical principles have to be in place, but you may do it a little different than we do it. Uh, that's okay. It's like meals and all kinds of other bedtimes and lots of other things that can vary. So, Yes, interesting. The, the, the dynamic between brothers and sisters that you hinted at there, it, it, it struck me uh, before I moved to the U.S. and pastoring in London, England, and there's some great families in the church, and, and it, it started to strike me that the, the boys, even at a young age, six, seven, eight, nine years old, who had sisters, the way they were treating their sisters was training them to know what kind of treatment counted as good treatment yes right so put it put it most bluntly um a a, a boy who honors and respects his sister in all manner of different things from not, not wrestling on the lounge floor with her and, and but honoring her and speaking to her in certain ways will will train her so that if she encounters some guy in her teenage years who doesn't treat her with appropriate respect She'll just think, who's this? Right. Right? Nobody speaks to her. It's not attractive to her. Exactly. What she's used to, she's used to being honored by 
boys. Exactly. As well as being wanted by her father. And there may be cultural differences, you know, how you do it in your family or even in London versus Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there, so we may open the door for a lady right. or pull the chair out or wait till they're seated. There's all kinds of ways that might be done differently from locale to locale. But these are symbols of respect and honor. And again, we're back to what is the fundamental thing both children need to learn is mm -hmm. to show respect yes. to other human, to love God and love your neighbor, to right. love, to, to submit to authority. Right. You know, Pastor Booth, I think um, we should probably get you up here more often. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, all of the things that you've talked about, all the things you've raised, I mean, it, it, it um, uh, I'd like to chase each of them down a half hour rabbit hole, but um, your time is, is precious and short and, um, uh, this podcast shouldn't go on forever. Okay. Um, uh, just a, a quick heads up again, for the sake of folks at All Saints, um, uh, we'll package this uh, media, Lord willing, in a way that makes it easier to consume if you're not able to make all these sessions. And But um, there's Men's Discipleship Breakfast uh, tomorrow, as we're talking today, but by the time you uh, hear this, it's going to be in the past, so there should be, Lord willing, a recording of that. You've got this, you've got that. Uh, Pastor Booth speaking, preaching on Sunday on Malachi 4. And then Pastor Shaw and I are going to be leading midweek through six sessions, just trying to explore this whole uh, issue of raising uh, faithful children. That's going to be the title of the series. And I particularly liked the point you made a few minutes ago. We're not trying to raise kids who just do what they're told. We're not looking for compliance. Uh, in the end, maybe you look for compliance from a six-month-old. But in the end, what you want to do is to raise somebody who <coughs> loves the Lord, who, who is a faithful child. Uh, and therefore a faithful adult, and you get to that wonderful, and this is a point now for parents, that painful moment where you start to see them spread their wings and flourish yes. as adults because they move on. Uh, maybe that's next down the road for us as we... Yeah, I need a session on teenagers and all that. Session on teenagers. By the way, if I could just put a little plug in on our mm. church website, uh, which is gcov, gcov org, mm -hmm. under, under sermons and lessons, I have two series on child training. I think one of them has 14 lessons, and the other one has 27 that goes into teenage years. And so if somebody wanted some additional materials, mm. uh, you can find, I think one of them is called Foundations of Child Training and the other one is uh, just Child Rearing. That's wonderful. But well, I remember we, we were in touch with that a, f a month or two ago and I had in mind to link to that from our church website. Okay. So, so um, uh, Lord willing, in the next week or so, you should be able to find that on the All Saints website, allsaintskirk.com slash media. There's a bunch of stuff there. Uh, Pastor Booth, I'm not going to take up any more of your time except to say thank you for thank joining you. us thanks for joining the podcast and we're looking forward to hearing from you tomorrow saturday sunday and um uh, as for those of you still watching uh, the lord bless you and bye for now thanks